Hey everyone, it's Drew. First of all, I'm wishing you a happy holidays. Nothing but love, peace, prosperity, and most importantly, wellness. Secondly, today's big idea of the week episode is a rerun from earlier in the year. If you aren't familiar with these episodes, you probably haven't heard this one, so stick around for the episode. Let's jump right into it. Hi everyone, Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. It's an honor to have you here with me on Big Idea Tuesday where I come to you with a thought, an idea, a distinction that's radically transformed my life for the better. Today's topic, seven tough things that make you a better human being. Seven tough things. These things aren't easy. I know they're not easy. They're not easy for me to implement in my own life. They're not gonna be easy for you to implement in your life either, but the real question is, are they worth it? Is it worth it if they help you sculpt yourself into a better, more whole, more grounded, complete version of who you already are? Well, that's for you to judge. Let's jump right in before we do. This episode is brought to you by, just kidding, I don't have sponsors right now, but if you want to say hi, you can text me 302-335-6565 and you can say hi and you can let me know what you thought about this podcast. It's been an honor to hop on the text, hop on the phone. Well, I actually have hopped on the phone with many of you. Uh, when my schedule allows, I hop on the phone for five minutes and chat with a few of you. It's been really great to get to know many of you. For those that I haven't responded to, I'm playing catch up. I think I've realized now I'm not going to be able to get back to everybody, but I'll do my best. And I try to do about five to 10 messages a day. So if you want to be maybe one of the people that I get a chance to get back to and say, hi, you could text me 302-335-6565 on today's topic, seven tough things that make you a better human being. Number one. Oh, I forgot. If you want to follow along with this topic today, you can click on the Instagram post, which is something that I wrote a couple years ago, and you can follow along in written form in the show notes to see these seven topics for today's episode. Number one, saying no to exciting but wrong opportunities. Saying no to the exciting opportunity that's not the right fit for you. Why is that something that's tough that would make you a better human being. So often in life, we're presented with things that are an old version of our goal or a version of our goal that we eventually want, but if we really think about what's important to us right now, it could derail us in our plan. What's an example? I'll give a very practical example. How many times have we seen, maybe there's some people that are listening, that had a goal, for example, to save a certain amount of money because it would allow them to be closer to their dreams in whatever shape or form that would look like. And then a new opportunity comes along. You're renting your house and a neighbor nearby moves and you see that your dream house is finally for sale. But you and your partner have decided that it's not the right time to purchase a property because of the goals that you have. So many people get caught up in the excitement, the inertia of wanting something now that could derail something that's more important to them for the longer term. That's one example. How about another example? You have an idea for what your dream role is and somebody comes to you or your dream job, dream role, dream gig, whatever it is that you want to do. And you're working towards that thing because you know it's going to bring you a sense of groundedness and joy with your career and your ability to help people through your work. And a new opportunity comes along. And that opportunity is maybe a little bit more money than you're doing right now. And a lot more hours than what you're doing right now. But you know that it will make you miserable. But it seems like you could 
finagle it. It seems like you could fudge it. It seems like you could try to figure it out. It seems like maybe if you squint and look from a distance, maybe it could be the right opportunity. Listen, nobody knows the right opportunity for you. Only you know the right opportunity for you. But when we catch ourselves in a place where we're experiencing FOMO, the fear of missing out, as a primary motivation to go towards something that isn't actually going to service our long-term goals, we end ourselves we end up catching ourselves in the act of saying, "You know what? This is an exciting opportunity, but I'm not sure if it's the right fit for me right now. Maybe it's the right fit for who I was a year ago. Maybe it's the right fit for where I was before I had these current goals and dreams. Maybe it's a right fit for me in the future, but I'm not going to sacrifice what's important to me right now. That's how people create and make their dreams and goals a reality is they have the courage to delay gratification. They have the courage to say, no, Steve Jobs had many speeches at Apple would say that the way that we get to design the iPhone or any other brilliant product that Apple works on is we say a thousand no's to get to a single yes. In that same way, we're designing our own life and a series of no's, the right no for what seems like a shortcut, what seems like a get rich quick scheme, what seems like the next right opportunity, but is actually not, brings us closer to our long-term goals. That's why saying no to exciting opportunities, but that are the wrong fit for you right now is a tough thing that will make you a better human being. Number two, deciding not to gossip about other people. When you cut gossip, out of your life. You make space for everything that actually matters. Listen, gossip is fun sometimes. I'm not going to lie. It's easy to talk about other people. And there's times where I might still find myself starting to lean in that direction. And I catch and I say, you know what? Honestly, I shouldn't really be talking about this person because it's not adding any value. Does that mean that you don't discuss other people's lives ever? Does that mean that you don't talk about hey, you know, this is what's going on with this person? No, but it's the intention because here's the thing. The more critical you are of others, the more critical you are of yourselves. This isn't some morality point that I'm making that we shouldn't gossip because it's not moral. No, human beings have been gossiping forever. It's baked into our evolutionary selves. Today, the challenge becomes when you have frequent gossiping, which used to be infrequent because we lived in these tiny little villages and other stuff. And actually, you know what? The truth is, I don't know if it was infrequent or not. That was just my guess. Let's just talk about today. The truth is, if gossip is a regular part of your life or a regular way that you connect with the people that are in your life, my biggest fear is this. The more critical you are of others, the more critical you are often of yourselves. You train your brain to look for the negative. You train your brain to find the fault in other people's lives and then guess what happens? That same thing that you trained to look for the fault in others, other people's lives and get excited to talk about it. Oh my gosh, did you see what happened with whoever? Your brain does that internally to yourselves. And then you wonder why you never start a project. You wonder why you never finish a project. Your own brain, which was trained to criticize and gossip without any sort of intended positive outcome out of it is now doing that to you. I don't care if you gossip. You can gossip all you want. What I do care about is that you're healthy and happy. And the challenge is it's hard to be healthy and happy when gossip is a regular part of our lives because that same lens gets turned on us and we become extremely self-critical and unhappy. Number three, having the humility to say sorry or repair even when it's not 100% your fault. That's the third thing on my list of seven tough things that make you a better human being. Why is having the humility to say sorry so challenging? Well, we have an ego and that ego wants to protect itself. And especially when we feel that we were not in the wrong, we don't wanna be the first person that said sorry. But it's so important to our relationships long-term, whether you're married, whether you have a partner, whether it's your relationship with your kids, whether it's your relationship with your coworkers, it's so important to use something that Dr. John Gottman from the Gottman Institute calls a soft starter. A soft starter is that when two people, well, let's look at the opposite of a soft starter. 
when you come in guns a blazing that you didn't do anything wrong and you put people on defense, you end up in a really crazy situation. You know, Byron Katie says defense is the first act of war. When two people come in defensive, immediately you escalate the situation and it becomes a bigger deal, which sucks out attention and energy in your life and prevents you from focusing on what truly matters. So what's the alternative? Instead of coming in defensive, instead of telling immediately people what they did wrong, even if it's 100% of their fault, I'm not saying play nice, I'm not saying be fake, but you could, in certain situations, use a soft starter. What's a soft starter? A soft starter is, hey, I know this thing happened between us, or I know that you may feel this way. I just want to say that that was not my intention, and I'd love to talk about it. It was not my intention to come across this way. I could see that there was like a reaction. Just know I'm on your team, and I want to talk about it, and... I want us to move beyond this point so that we can get back to how it was. A soft starter is not like, hey, look, I was at fault and you're making yourself the blame even if it wasn't something that you did. A soft starter is understanding the perspective, diffusing the situation by saying, I acknowledge this thing is going on. Know that if I put you in that situation that wasn't my intention, we're on the same team, I love you, and you're immediately starting with the end in mind. You're letting them know that they can put down their guard. You know what happens when you let people know that, you, that they can put down their guard? They come to the table, not always, not always. They come to the table, they're more likely to come to the table and say, you know what, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean that. Because people's biggest fear is being attacked and being wrong in those arguments. And when you diffuse a situation, they drop that fear and they can own what they did wrong. And if, in the, if they don't own it, they're not there. And it doesn't mean that you can't have a very firm conversation with somebody. Hey, this wasn't my intention. I just want to say like, we're on the same team. Let me hear you out first. Then they talk and let's say they don't own it. Well, you can come back and say, look, I can understand things. I can see that perspective because the truth is if you really put yourself in their shoes, you could see any perspective. It doesn't mean that they're right. I can see that perspective, but I also want to be clear. That's not what I asked for. And in this situation, in this situation, I asked for something different. So I totally see your perspective. And I think that we don't have to argue back and forth, but I do want to say, I just don't see it that way. So let's focus on now a better outcome. How do we get to a better intention? So a soft starter is a way to diffuse that from the beginning. So you don't get in a combative defensive place back and forth, which puts you in a situation where you don't end up getting any resolution at all. That's why having the humility to say sorry with a soft starter, you could Google it and Dr. Gottman goes into it a little bit deeper. You'll get some more practical examples. I realized that when I try to make a fake conversation between two people, if I don't go into specifics, it actually doesn't really even make any sense. So I'll try to stick to specifics. And in the meantime, if that didn't make sense, Google Soft Starter Gottman Institute. Let's move on. Number four, having the courage to tell others when you are hurt. Wow. This is a big one, especially for achievers, especially for people pleasers, especially for people that are often the leader in their family or peer group or at work. It's so challenging to let our guards down and let our guard down and tell people when we've been hurt by something. Does that mean that we're all snowflakes and we're so soft and we can't handle anything and we got to let everybody know every time we're hurt about a situation? No, that's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is that when there's somebody meaningful in your life that's done something that's hurt you, you have a couple of options. One option is to ignore it, right? By the nature of me saying that it was something that it hurt you, I'm not saying that it was something that was small. Something small, you know somebody's intention, you may say, ah, they didn't mean that, they said that thing, but I know who they are, they just fumble with their words often, I'm not gonna feel offended or hurt by that. But then there are situations that you get hurt. Now, let's look at the options that you have. One option is you don't say anything. You hold that hurt internally, and what ends up happening? That hurt turns into resentment. We often feel that people should know better. Why did they do that? We don't get a chance to have dialogue with them and see their side of the story or what we did that set up the situation. So when we hold hurt in and it turns into resentment, 
we're less likely to want to spend time with that person. We're less likely to want to make effort with them. And then one day, if that hurt and resentment builds up and another situation happens and another situation happens and another situation happens, you find yourself in a place where one day you freaking explode. And that doesn't do anybody any good at all. There's a way to bring up hurt early it takes, it's a two-step process <laughs> that I'm going to get into. There's a way to bring up hurt early in a way that is not defensive for you or the other person, doesn't put you in defense mode, but still express why things matter to you. So let's say you had an important occasion and your friend couldn't make that occasion last minute, but that was so important to you. You had communicated to them, you had told them, you were relying on that individual to be there for you. And then they couldn't show up and it wasn't an emergency. It didn't seem like there was any sort of valid reason that you could understand and you left hurt from the situation. When you first things first in that two step process of going beyond hurt and going into communication, the first step is to put our ego aside, put our ego aside of right and wrong. And also to put our ego aside that says, I'm the tough leader. I'm the alpha. I can take anything. Nobody ever is going to hurt me. I'm not going to be vulnerable. That's often the energy that keeps hurt perpetuating and has you one day just cut somebody out of your life because you've had enough. So it's putting that down. And then in a situation in person, if possible on the phone, it's about bringing things up in a way not calling somebody up and texting them. Don't do it over text. That's just the worst. But it's calling somebody up and saying, hey, listen, just wanted to like check in. Also, you know, I wanted to bring something up is that I was a little hurt that you didn't show up over here and I just wanted to check in, right? In fact, let me backtrack a little bit. Before you even come in with your hurt, first come in with inquiry because you can't possibly know even though you do have feelings of hurt you can't possibly know what was going on with them right so you can come to them and say hey listen not passive aggressive but hey listen i was actually really looking forward to having you there i'm not gonna lie i was a little hurt but i wanted to check in i want to see is everything okay with you is everything okay with you did i not get how busy you are in your life and i don't mean it in a demeaning way right this is me talking to you not to the other person you can check in with people in a way where it's about them and they get a chance to explain. No, nothing was going on. I was just busy. It's like, oh, wow. Like, I actually want to take ownership because I don't think I told you how important or maybe it wasn't clear how important this was for me that you show up. And I left a little bit feeling like you didn't have my back. And I just wanted to check in about that. When you check in with people, instead of making up a fucking story about why they did what they did, you get to resolution. What's the goal? Is the goal to maintain the hurt or is the goal to get to resolution and continue to strengthen your relationship? I'll tell you what, if you're a high achiever, people pleaser, if you're somebody who's often the leader in your family, one of the reasons that people like to hold hurt internally is it's another reminder that you're all alone, that nobody's there to support you, and nobody has your back. So it perpetuates this insecurity of it's always on you, you always have to do it, and nobody else can help you. Instead of, hey, this was important to me and I just wanted to check in. If you care about somebody, let them know that you're hurt and give them the opportunity for dialogue. Anything else is either perpetuating an insecurity or it's selfish. If you're somebody who says, no, I'm not going to tell them they don't deserve to know because they're not close to me anymore. Okay. Then don't fucking complain about it anymore. You can always see what matters to you by your willingness to complain about the situation. If you want to go tell somebody, if you want to go complain to a friend and say, Oh, you can't believe what Susie did to me or Becky or this situation or Dan, your complaining shows that there's a wound. Now, there are situations where somebody might have let you down and there could be a repeated past pattern of that and they just are not in a space in their life to be able to support you the way that you need it. Maybe they can't be a good friend or family member to you right now because they're dealing with something in their own life. That's not right or wrong. That's just real. And if you fully understand that, then you don't go into complaining. And there's also some part of you, not that you wouldn't be hurt, but along with the hurt is a, a sense of compassion. You have compassion for the situation that they're in. 
and you don't know what they're exactly dealing with, or maybe you do, and you have compassion because you knew that you know that if they could do better, they would do better. All right, let's move on to the next item. Number five, keeping your heart open even after a loss. Keeping your heart open even after a loss. Whether that loss is a breakup, a divorce, the loss of a family member, the loss of a business that you were working on, an idea that you wanted to make happen. When things don't work out, sometimes our ego wants to use that as an excuse to never trust again, to never open our hearts again. Whether that heart is for romantic love or whether that heart is for our visions and dreams and purpose in life. Why? I shouldn't have even tried. You know, who was I to even think that it was going to work out? Or this is the third time I've had my heart broken. I'm, you know, people are just whack. I'm not going to trust another human being and let them in. And the truth is that has less to do with real love and that has less to do with your true ambitions and goals in life than it does with your ego. Your ego is always looking for excuse to protect itself. And when we experience a loss, one thing that it wants to do is close down. But what happens when we close down? When we close down, we literally close down ourselves to others, to opportunities, and to a vision of the next version of us. You know, I often think about J.K. Rowling's quote, um, rock bottom became the solid foundation on which I rebuilt my life. Rock bottom became the solid foundation on, we, on which I rebuilt my life. And there's another Joseph Campbell quote that I've mentioned a few times in this podcast. And that quote is, we must be willing to give up the life we thought we should be living, to live the life that we were meant to live. Often in loss, that has us wanting to close our heart. There's a lesson. There's a lesson in it for us. And when we find that lesson, we can rebuild our entire future and our entire life. We can let go of the life we were thought that we thought we were supposed to live and now step into the life that we were meant to live. So I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying there's a time, there's not a time for grieving. I'm not saying don't take care of yourself. I'm just saying that when we want to close our heart after a loss, it's important to remember that that doesn't do the world or you any good. And we're counting on you. We're counting on you. The world needs you to be the best, most complete person that you can be for yourself and for humanity. All right, number six, catching yourself needlessly complaining. I don't know if this one needs a full breakdown, but I will repeat something that I said earlier, which is the more critical you are of others, the more critical you are of yourself. This is why critical people are often hypercritical people. We all criticize. We all find something wrong in something. It's part of human nature. But hypercritical people, the people that look forward to finding out something wrong, they're looking forward to finding your faults. They don't realize it, but they're looking forward to finding their own faults too. So they're less likely to start. They're less likely to finish. They're less likely to go after their goals and dreams in life. Number seven on our seven tough things that make you a better human being, being the bigger person, even when you feel you've been wronged. What does being the bigger person mean? It means bringing empathy and compassion to every situation. What does being a small person mean? The opposite of being the bigger person. What does being a smaller person mean? A smaller person, I'll use a paraphrase, a quote from Reverend Michael Beckwith, uh, who's a reverend here in Los Angeles at the um, spiritual church Agape, Agape uh, International. He said, being a small-minded person is a person who's all wrapped up in themselves. They cannot see any perspective outside the limited perspective that's in their mind. So if we look at the opposite of that, if a small-minded person is somebody who can only see their own perspective, their own situation, being a bigger person means actually having a bigger perspective. And what gives us perspective? Empathy and compassion. Empathy is... Let me put myself in the other person's shoes. How did they become that person? 
How did they end up in that situation? Even though we feel wronged and maybe what they did was not right, how can I put myself in that person's shoes? Now, I'm not talking about extreme acts of violence. I'm not talking about sexual abuse and uh, sexual acts of violence. I'm talking about the vast majority of the things that most of us experience on a day-to-day basis. Things that other people do, our coworkers, our family, our kids, our uh, partner, I try to combine spouse and partner, our partner, our spouse, our whoever, a stranger, people who vote differently than us. When we're a bigger person and we bring empathy to the situation, we put ourselves in their shoes and we try to imagine how they got to the destination or the conclusion that they got to. And in most situations, if you really work hard, it actually takes time. It's like a little bit of a meditation. You can see that if you had the same circumstances, the same background, the same parent, you would be that person too. We like to get righteous and think that, no, I would never end up being that person. That may be true, but there's many times where people are put in different situations and end up at a similar conclusion as that other individual. So being the bigger person means compassion and empathy. Empathy, I already talked about. Compassion is a sense of reverence, a sense of understanding, bringing understanding to the situation, even when it doesn't call for it. So when you're the bigger person, empathy and compassion, even when wronged, you're able to handle situations firmly. There's nothing wrong with putting boundaries on a situation or telling people how they wronged you or how you want them to show up. There's nothing wrong with that at all. And often in life, we need to do that. But we do it with grace and ease because we can understand and see bigger than our own limited perspective, which means what? It makes us less reactionary. And when we're less reactionary and when we're less emotional with the situation, we can do the right thing, not just for us, but for the other person too. Guys, this has been, guys and girls, human beings, this has been seven tough things that make you a better human being. I hope you found value in it. If you did and you liked today's episode, text me, 302-335-6565. I'm Drew Perot, wishing you a beautiful rest of the day. I'll see you back on Thursday for a fantastic interview with my dear friend, John Amaral, who is one of the featured experts and healers in the new Goop documentary series that's on next Netflix, Nextflix. A little tongue tied today. Uh, Netflix. Goop Lab. He's one of the energy workers. We have an interview with him coming out on Thursday. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Share this episode with a friend if you enjoyed it or leave a re- review. If you aren't subscribed to the podcast, podcast, oh man, I should quit while I'm ahead. Podcast. If you aren't subscribed to the podcast, please do. Talk to you soon.